Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome everyone back to our discussion <clears throat> on Wild Awakening. So the truth that we are searching for the true reality that we want to realize the true nature of mind <clears throat> the wisdom of enlightenment that we want to achieve the genuine liberation from samsara that we want to achieve is uh, nothing outside our mind according to Vajrayana teachings according to Mahamudra and Dzogchen thank you this enlightenment Uh, nirvana, freedom from samsara is nothing outside. The very fact of uh, looking for such freedom outside becomes the greatest obstacle for us to achieve it. The very fact of looking for enlightenment outside of our ordinary experience of mind becomes the greatest uh, obscuration. And so therefore, from the Mahamudra and the Dzogchen point of view, The enlightenment is right here. Right here in our mind, right here in our experiences of ordinary life, right here within our experience of klesha, such as passion, aggression, and ignorance. You know, right here within our ordinary experience of uh, the world, our ordinary experience of perceiving mind, ordinary experience of thoughts, ordinary experience of concepts, right within that uh, enlightenment, awakening, is present, is nowhere outside. As we can see, our tendency is to look outside all the time. No matter how much joy and happiness we have, we still look outside of that happiness for happiness. No matter how much we possess material goods, <clears throat> we probably have more than what we need, but still we are searching more outside. <clears throat> Our tendency is always to look out, always to search more and more outside the very happiness we already have. 
And this is, of course, in the general Buddhist teaching. <clears throat> it is called um, <laughs> it is called Ting Tong. Pong Sam Zuna. Oh! Pong Sam Zuna. It's called Poverty Mentality. <laughs> <laughs> Poverty mentality, dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction, uh, you know, that's really the true characteristics of a samsaric mind, right? dissatisfaction. And for that we have a very nice anthem. Can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> and if he can't get no satisfaction, then who can? <laughs> In terms of material wealth, enjoyment. You know, this sense of dissatisfaction, sense of poverty mentality, always looking for more and more and more outside what we have becomes the primary, most essential uh, obstacle for achieving liberation and enlightenment from Mahamudra, Dzogchen and Tantra point of view. There's always this sense of uh, uh, missing something, isn't it? We're always missing something, we're always looking for something, never really settled, satisfied, never really reached to the point of being ready to further penetrate. We always touch the surface and then hit with this sense of dissatisfaction all the time. Uh, we always want to be someone else. We always want to be somewhere else. All the time. That is a very clear indication of our Obscuration, obstacles, clear indication of this heart of dissatisfaction, this heart of a poverty mentality. So from Mahamudra, Dzogchen and the Vajrayana teaching point of view, you are perfectly fine as who you are. You are perfectly fine at where you are, you're perfectly fine if you can turn your mind inwardly and further penetrate a little bit. You will find enlightenment right there. The very tendency of looking for enlightenment outside becomes the fact that leads us to finding no enlightenment. No matter how hard you try, you will never find it. Truth is not out there. Truth is within. Realization is within. Enlightenment is within. Awakening is within. And so, therefore, Mahamudra <clears throat> uses this example, analogy, um, of, uh, of a 
<laughs> buffalo. Yes. Do you all own a buffalo? <laughs> you, you must. To practice Mahamudra. <laughs> I know it's a lot to ask, but <laughs> <coughs> sorry. How about a Honda? How about a Honda? <laughs> That's a good thing. <coughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, Mahamudra uses the analogy of a farmer who owns a buffalo, and while buffalo is at home. Karlando. No, in, in, huh? in its stable. Stable. Not staples. <laughs> <laughs> stable? <coughs> yes. Now, while the buffalo is in its stable at home, but the farmer thinking it has lost the buffalo. Buffalo is gone outside. So searching for his buffalo is the example given here for searching for your enlightenment. And so when you are looking for buffalo, the buffalo footprint will surface everywhere. Right? When you're looking for a buffalo, then you will see buffalo footprints everywhere in Berkeley, San Francisco, <laughs> Silicon Valley. <laughs> you will see a lot of buffalo footprints. And so you will see a footprint going this way, and another going that way. And so you search. You go after your footprint of your buffalo. And that footprint gradually leads you to a beautiful cave in a Himalayan mountain. <laughs> isn't it? It will lead you to a beautiful cave in the Himalayan mountain. You go up there and you surely, sure enough, you will find a buffalo there. A beautiful buffalo in a cave. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the problem is that buffalo is not your buffalo. <laughs> Right? It's not your buffalo. It belongs to a yogi called Melarepa. It's beautiful, yet it's not yours. And you can't steal it as a Buddhist. And pretend it's your buffalo. It's not going to work. And then you find, yes, this is not my buffalo. <laughs> and then you st start searching for your buffalo again, and the footprints will lead you to River Ganges, Ganges Bank. And again, once again, sure enough, you'll find a really nice buffalo, very relaxed, sleeping, you know, uh, wonderful buffalo at the bank of river Ganges. But again the problem is, it's not your buffalo. You know, it belongs to an Indian yogi, Tilopa. And since it's Tilopa's a buffalo, if you try to own it, it may kick you. <laughs> since it's not your buffalo, the problem is the buffalo doesn't recognize you and you don't recognize your buffalo, this buffalo, it's a different buffalo. And you can keep on searching outside the footprint, searching the footprints, and it will lead you high and low in, in different places. You'll find different buffaloes, but none of them are your buffalo at the end. The place where you will find your buffalo is back here. At the end, you give up searching for your buffalo outside and come home. 
and then you realize, oh, your buffalo has been there all the time. It has never left the stable, your home. It's always been there. But searching for that buffalo outside was terminal. Useless. Yeah. <clears throat> Useless. Meaningless. Uh, futile. And then when you come home, finally when you find your own buffalo, it is so different, isn't it? Finding your own buffalo is so different from finding someone else's buffalo. <laughs> He's looking for his buffalo. <laughs> <clears throat> and so finally, when we find our own buffalo, <clears throat> you know, it's a really very uh, romantic, isn't it? It's very special when you come in contact with your own buffalo. You can imagine that moment. Imagine the moment when you're looking at your buffalo and your buffalo looking at you, both recognizing each other and finding such a place. Finding such a place where you find your own enlightenment, your own awakening becomes extremely powerful experience. And that experience comes from when you stop searching outside. When you finally give up any hope, any fear, then you will find your buffalo. You know, when you are uh, uh, chasing after the footprints, with so much hope of finding your buffalo and so much fear of not finding your buffalo, you know, when you're going through that journey of hope and fear, searching your buffalo outside, then you will never find your buffalo. And when you really find it, is when you finally give up looking for your buffalo outside and come home. That's where you find your buffalo here. So this metaphor that Mahamudra teaching to use is a really uh, wonderful, you know, wonderful ex example here for finding enlightenment within. For that reason, the great yogi Melarepa sang. Milarepa saying, Samsara is nothing deported to somewhere else. Nirvana is nothing imported from somewhere else. I've discovered for sure the mind is the Buddha. The Hikabs are the name of Sumdo. The name of the name of the name of the name of the name Awesome. And when this type of decisiveness <clears throat> arrives is when we realize the true nature of mind directly. And that's called enlightenment. And we must, uh, actually we must, uh, we must not fantasize or exaggerate the idea of achieving enlightenment. And we think that always it has to be something very dramatic, you know, very uh, special. But from Mahamudra, Dzogchen point of view, it is so ordinary. 
so ordinary that one day when we recognize our own nature of mind, realize the true nature of our thoughts and emotions, that is the beginning of our enlightenment. And so, therefore, like Malarepa said, samsara and nirvana are not two separate things. There is no such thing as uh, negativity, no such thing as uh, samsara to be abandoned, left behind. And there is no such place as enlightenment, nirvana, to go to. Samsara and nirvana are basically uh, mm -hmm. just conceptual creations. Yes, conceptual creations. These, <clears throat> you know, this duality of samsara and nirvana are conceptual creation. For, the, for that reason, it is taught here that the samsara and the nirvana are inseparable. They are inseparable, like two sides of the coin. When they say they are inseparable, it means the true nature of samsara is nirvana. It's enlightened right from the beginning. And that nature, if we can recognize, then it is enlightenment. When we fail to recognize that nature, then it is samsara. It's that simple. And so for that reason, you know, samsara and nirvana, when we separate them so much with the concepts, labels and thoughts. In that moment, we will never find enlightenment. And so, in order to illustrate such teachings of samsara, nirvana being inseparable, there is a nice song from a yogi of uh, Mahamudra, uh, the Kagyu master, Sangpajari. Um, Chika tsepe dongzana chakram churu shuade, kova nyangde so ngotepe lobyong shilade kolasam. Chini So it would be good for us to write this verse down. It says, when the springtime sun starts to warm the earth, when the springtime sun starts to warm the earth, and the ice melts into water, and the ice melts into water, Don't you know? Don't you know? This is the Lama teaching you. Don't you know? This is the Lama teaching you. Samsara is nirvana. <coughs> Samsara is nirvana. Chikatsepe dungja nan charum churu juwat. Kova nyang de son water ben la ben shilata kolasa. So I'll sing it um, one time by myself and then we can all sing it again together. <coughs> when the springtime sun starts to warm the earth and the ice melts into water, don't you know this is the Lama teaching you samsara is nirvana? Springtime sun starts to warm the earth, 
Samsara and Nirvana or enlightenment are said to be like ice and water. Ice, <coughs> the true nature of ice, Chaurum Giran, Nubu, Kurangubu Jagran, Hindi, Churma. Basic physical makeup of water, of ice itself is water. When water uh, is uh, put in a certain condition of element, then it freezes into ice. You know, when it's uh, into that element of ice, then it's painful. If you slip, it hurts. Or if you pick up a piece of ice and throw at someone, it can hurt. So that's like samsara. It creates sometimes a little bit of pain. Whereas the true nature of that ice, the water, and it has always been water, no matter what. Even when it's uh, appearing in the form of a solid ice, still its true substance has never changed from being water. And when it meets the right conditions again, you know, then that, that ice can melt back into its original state, which is water. And so therefore, samsara and nirvana are like ice and water. There's no difference. You know, when it's uh, in certain condition, then it freezes. When it's in another positive condition, then it, mel it melts back into its original state, the water. And this is taught to us very clearly by this song. Now we'll sing it three times. <laughs> <laughs> when the springtime sun starts to warm the earth and the ice melts into water, don't you know? here is then how can we recognize this true nature of mind? How can we actualize this nature of mind? How can we achieve enlightenment as taught in Mahamudra and Dzogchen? 
Then the answer is, according to Mahamudra and Dzogchen, the answer is, when you truly rely on genuine instruction. And when you truly rely on a genuine master of the lineage, lineages, when you truly rely on your own nature of a mind, then one can recognize the nature of a mind and achieve enlightenment in one lifetime. in this lifetime. And so therefore, there are three elements here that we need to develop confidence in. Confidence in the instruction, confidence in the master, confidence in your nature of mind. You know, these three confidence are the key to recognizing, realizing, actualizing this true nature of mind, which is enlightenment. You know, it's easy. <laughs> right? No. <laughs> yes. There's a story that um, Many of the students of Melarepa told him one day that, uh, please tell us who you are emanation of. You must be emanation of a great enlightened being, a Buddha or great Bodhisattva. You, know, you are not an ordinary person who has achieved enlightenment in one lifetime. You are truly a special being, right from the beginning. You are an emanation. Please tell us who you are emanation of. And Melarepa said, um, That that is that is actually a great insult to the Dharma. Melarepa said, that's a really great insult to the Dharma and <clears throat> great wrong view about the Dharma. Melarepa said, I'm not emanation of anybody. I'm an ordinary sentient being, full of negative karmas. And he said, because of the power of Dharma, because of the power of the wisdom of these teachings, because of the power of these instructions and effectiveness of these teachings, you know, I could transform all the negative karmas and perfect the path in one lifetime, achieve enlightenment in one lifetime. Malagaba said, the reason why I could achieve such a thing is because of the power of Dharma, because of the power of this wisdom, because of the power of the, the lineage's instructions. It's not because, he said, it's not because I'm a special person. And from there you can see how important it is uh, for us to have confidence in the instructions, how important it is, it is for us to rely on the t teachings and instructions and implement them as instructed. You know, not as you like. <laughs> Sometimes we do that, you know, we want to choose from the teachings, instructions, we want to do certain things they told us and certain things we want to kind of forget. <laughs> uh, you know, selective forgetfulness. <laughs> uh, 
which I call Samsimers. <laughs> Not all Samsimers, but some. <laughs> uh, selectively, we want to forget things. And selectively, we want to remember some things. You know, those things are not very effective in terms of path. So if we implement the instructions as instructed in the teachings by Buddha, by great masters of the Mahamudra and Dzogchen, and if we rely on a genuine lineage master, a realized master, and if we rely on the uh, true nature of our mind, then there is uh, no way but to recognize our nature of mind. Same more matter with Tabman. Mm -hmm. Same yeah. more matter with Tabman. Then there's no choice for us but to recognize the nature of mind. <laughs> yes. Recognition comes naturally. Enlightenment comes naturally. <clears throat> it's not a problem. And so therefore, <clears throat> the way we can accomplish this goal and achieve such realization is through relying on the path of Mahamudra and Dzogchen. And so therefore, um, at this point, since we are talking about Guru, <clears throat> I would like to discuss about Guru in a disciple relationship. There were some questions last night also. So in this tradition of Mahamudra and Dzogchen, and the Guru, we must understand the principle of Guru. You know, what role they are playing, and the disciple, and what role we are playing in this whole journey. Uh, I use this example that Guru is like a mirror. Simply a mirror, nothing more, nothing less. Guru is like a mirror in which we can see our own face of enlightenment. And you know, Guru, lineage gurus, you know, they are serving as a great mirror for us, a mirror of enlightenment. And uh, you know, mirror does not walk into our house. Right? When we have a mirror in, in our home. You know, we choose our mirror. We go out and say, oh, what room we have and what kind of mirror will suit the best in our room. You know, long mirror, square mirror, uh, what do you call? Ovular. Huh? Ovular. Ovular? <laughs> <laughs> so what is it? Over. Over? over. <clears throat> yeah, over. <laughs> you know, <laughs> round mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Good translator. So you share good yep down, chi chung down, say down, so down not so but so some bad and some and dumb chong. Mm -hmm. So no matter what shape the mirror has, whether it's a square mirror, circular, <coughs> or, <laughs> circular oval, <laughs> um, then it will reflect whatever is in place before it still. Same. Same quality. You know, it doesn't matter what shape you have, what size of mirror you have. And size, shape, and uh, type of mirror, it's up to you. You must choose your mirror uh, according to your uh, mirror. Mm -hmm. 
inclinations. Yes. Then, once we have the mirror, you know, mirror reflects everything, isn't it? Dirty face, clean face, pure, impure, everything. Mirror is not afraid to reflect. And a mirror does not uh, shy away from reflecting ugly or beautiful, clean or dirty. In a mirror does not refrain itself from presenting who you are as it is. In a mirror does not uh, make you reflect better. It will make you see better or worse, but reflects as it is. So that's what the Guru's role is on the path, right? Like mirror. So when your face is a little bit dirty, then it's reflected on the mirror, and the mirror will help us to clean. How? The mirror doesn't stretch out an arm to clean your face or, or, or change your makeup. <clears throat> you know, it's you who chooses how you want to clean up and how you want to look. What makeup you want to put, it's totally up to you. Right? What brand? <laughs> what color of lipstick? You know, what color of... Uh, 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 if you want to paint your face, what color you paint it? Totally up to us, you know. <clears throat> For Halloween. <laughs> One year we painted, yeah? Yeah, 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 we painted in Seattle. So, <clears throat> like that, you know, we could choose our colors. But, what does mirror help? Mirror help us to see clearly how we look, who we are, and present a clear picture. And so therefore, you know, Guru's role on this path is very simple. It's like a mirror, reflecting all the qualities on the path. First, in the morning, the reflection in the mirror is not very pretty. You know, then on the middle, the reflection in the mirror is a path, like lots of working cleaning. And then the mirror's reflection at the end is showing the fruition. And so therefore, <clears throat> the journey of a guru-disciple relationship is like a mirror and a person standing in front of a mirror. And what we call in the Mahamudra path here, it is called the path of devotion. So devotion is placed a very strong emphasis on devotion here. And so devotion is like the light, according to Mahamudra teachings. Devotion is like the light. And even if there is a mirror, if there is a people standing in front, but if it's dark, you can stand there for ages and still can't see much in this darkness. So, standing in front of a mirror without light, according to Mahamudra, is not very useful. And it has some impact maybe, but not great impact, not beneficial. So what brings a lot of benefit on this journey is when we can switch on the light. And then you can see clearly you can have a reflection very clear. You can continue your journey there. And so therefore, Mahamudra says, devotion is like the light. And that light is something that we have to turn on, or switch on. You know, mirror doesn't switch on the light. The you know, mirror just reflects. And so, therefore, you know, guru-disciple relationship is very simple. Very simple. Mirror represents, a mirror presents, and it shows you who you are, and then it's up to you what you want to do with it. You know, 
And so therefore that's what the guru, disciple relationship is in general in Mahamudra, Dzogchen and uh, Vajrayana. And the person who is playing the central role in this whole thing is the disciple. Right? It's a disciple. A disciple has been very active. Right? First, in active in choosing the mirror. Second, bringing that mirror home, hanging it. And the third, using that mirror again and again and again. It's very active. Um, and so therefore, the guru-disciple relationship <clears throat> is something that develops naturally. It's not something one can impose. It's not something we need to rush to. It is something that has to come naturally and develop naturally, deeper and deeper and deeper. That's why in Buddha's teachings we call the teachers or masters or the gurus a spiritual friend. Right? There needs to, to be a time. We need to have a time to develop this friendship. In, in order to call someone your friend, you need a little bit of time to develop friendship. So spiritual friend, also we need a time to develop this friendship. And that time, you know, Buddha taught in the sutras and tantras that time you can take as long as three years, Buddha said. You know, as long as three years, one can take time to analyze this relationship, or to develop this relationship. Uh, like last night's discussion, after three years we must find a conclusion. Yes. Or no. You know, we must find a place to put our period. Otherwise, it will be run on sentences and nobody will read it or can't read it really. And so, therefore, you know, there is also a story uh, that a uh, great Tibetan master went to China uh, at the invitation of a Chinese emperor who was looking for a teacher. And the master thought, oh, since he was the spiritual master, the king should bow to the master. And the king was thinking, since he is the emperor of the whole uh, place, you know, the, the master should bow to the emperor. So when they met, no... <laughs> neither of them bowed. Yeah, neither of them bowed. And then king did not accept him as a master. He said, oh, I have to examine. I have to have this time to develop. And then it went on and on and on for many years. And then king was looking, emperor was looking for, two, you know, masters. <clears throat> and then he realized that master was the most suitable master for him, most learned, most realized. And then when he went back to look for that master, that master has already passed away. So it is uh, used as an example. It's a true story, but also used as an example to show if, if it takes too long, it's not very beneficial. But too short also is not beneficial in haste. So we must take appropriate time <clears throat> to develop this relationship. And so therefore, master uh, Master and our relationship, disciple, as we are to our teachers, you know, that should develop naturally, you know, gradually. It will deepen as time goes and becomes deeper and deeper. But as I told yesterday, you know, there's uh, importance at the beginning to rely on outer master, and in the middle, you must rely on the instructions rather than a physical guru. And at the end, you must rely on your nature of mind, <clears throat> more than instructions. Um, <clears throat> so 
Dango Chi Lama Dengo. Pardo de Nanke Lama, Deshe Kai Lamas. Sanji Jikala. I'm the Relying on the external guru or the external master who is a person. Then in the middle, we rely on the master that is the teachings of the Buddha. And in the end, we rely on the Lama that is our own mind, the nature of our own mind. No matter how important the Guru seems to be in the Mahamudra Dokshin teachings, <clears throat> but the most important thing on this journey is ourselves as a practitioner. That's the most important. Out to you and say, Oh, there are two exits here. You can go this way, you can go that way. Right? When you go, want to go out of a certain <coughs> environment. <coughs> that person can be saying that for <coughs> many hours, weeks, months. But if the person who's receiving the instruction does not get up and walk towards that door, you will never get out of that place. Right? No matter how, the <clears throat> how good the instructor is, <clears throat> no matter how clear the instruction is, no matter how profound the instructions may be, but if one does not follow <clears throat> that instruction, <clears throat> then it does not bring any result. So likewise, no matter how nice, uh, great a guru is, no matter how great his instructions or her instructions may be uh, of how we can get out of samsara, get out of this place of uh, <clears throat> uh, bewilderment. But if we as a disciple do not walk out, you know, stand up and walk towards that door, we will never walk out of this samsara transcend the confusion of samsara. And so therefore, center point, the key person on this whole journey in Mahamudra and Dzogchen, which is the same as general Buddhist teachings, <clears throat> is the, the disciples, is the practitioners. You know, we are the absolute savior for ourselves. There is no savior outside in Buddhism. The gurus, <clears throat> Bodhisattvas, Buddhas, you know, they are not saviors. <clears throat> I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> you know, this is kind of bad news <laughs> in Buddhism. <clears throat> On one hand, you know, there is no saviors outside. Of course, it's much easier when there is a savior, right? You just rely on that person and then you're okay. But when they say there is no savior, you are the savior for yourself. It is, on one hand, quite depressing. On the other hand, enlightening. Really enlightening, because you can see how much power each individual has in order to free oneself. You don't have to rely on anyone, including the gurus. Ultimately speaking, don't have to rely on anyone. And you are fully equipped. You have a full power, full potential, and a full wisdom, prajna, to free yourself from the uh, chuba. Confusion. Confusion of samsara. It's very enlightening. <clears throat> it's like uh, Like when we grow up, you know, sometimes we, we, we felt like how can we do things alone without our parents or without our, you know, uh, relatives, friends, and who has nurtured us. You know, we feel that at the beginning. And then later you, you realize at some point you recognize, oh, I don't need any of those. I can be totally fine. I can do everything myself. I can take care of myself. Not only that, I can take care of many other people. Mm -hmm. Many other friends. 
So when you finally recognize that, you can see there is a sense of great freedom, great joy. <clears throat> and so therefore, it is important for us to see here the potential, the power, and the possibility of uh, our own freedom, our own freedom from samsara, enlightenment is just within us, it's nothing outside. So therefore, we don't need to wait something to happen from outside. <clears throat> we just have to start. Start working towards freeing ourselves, achieving enlightenment. That <laughs> <clears throat> and to help us accomplish this, we should sing a song that was spoken by someone who actually reached the final fruition of this path. The yogi Milarepa will sing the song called The Six Questions. The Yutuwa Dandu, the name Mengale, Danga, Ninja Gogudu, the Damaso, Chiwetu. So this is on page eight of the chant handout, and this song this song contains questions that are questions that at the same time personal instructions that we can use on our path. <clears throat> How many people don't know this song? Quite a few. So the, those of us who know the song can sing the first three lines, and then we'll start over from the beginning. <coughs> Mind has even more projections than there are dust modes in the
said that singing the song of realization of uh, <clears throat> Mahamudra and Dzogchen masters will help us to bring the same realization in our mind stream. And so we not only sing them as a uh, uh, song, devotional song, but we sing them as an instruction, a great instruction <clears throat> to follow. Instruction. <laughs> It's a very profound instruction. Then then go check it. Nyam ni chana yang sang ye tu. Sang ye tu. By practicing the instructions that are contained in just this one psalm alone, one can attain enlightenment. <clears throat> so, following. This journey of Mahamudra, one of the most important thing in terms of our practice is always looking at the nature of mind. looking at the present nature of mind. And resting within that nature and relaxing at ease. Always looking or penetrating the present nature of a mind becomes the most important practice here. No matter what mind is there in front of you, it doesn't matter. Whether it is a conceptual mind, whether it is a perception, whether it is a, uh, an emotional mind, doesn't matter just to look. Look at its essence. Rest within that, which means do not need to look somewhere else to rest, as usual. We always look somewhere else to rest. 
we always want to look at something else rather than this mind. Instead, the instruction of Mahamudra is to look at the present mind, whatever it is. Look at its essence, look nakedly. <coughs> Rest within that and relax at ease. Yeah, it's easy. Simple. Melarebe. Chedjitu, Chokisha, Chedjitu, Dismu, Luna. Mira Rebe teaches this in the three stages of first, <coughs> looking nakedly, second, resting directly, and third, relaxing at ease. So it's very easy. Chedjitu, Moton, Chetan, Namka, Tabaton, Melarebe. Here the sings, looking nakedly I see the essence. What I see is beyond concept. What I see resembles space. Tada Jesam Dinelo La Teka Chetji Dagam Bakapsu Kartondo. The Chetji Dagum do Swami. So Milarepa is instructing us here to <coughs> look nakedly at the nature of the mind of the present moment. So if this mind of the present moment involves a mental affliction such as anger or aggression, then we simply look nakedly at that anger. And if this mind of the present moment is perceiving a beautiful form, such as a flower, then we look directly, immediately <coughs> at this sense perception. And if we are listening to pleasant sounding music with our ear consciousness, then we look directly at that perception. And if we're watching TV and we see someone we don't like, then we look directly at that one. Right. We probably see lots of people we don't like on TV. And it's important for us to look at our minds when that happens. If we just let our thoughts continue to go outwards toward the TV, <laughs> then that further disturbs our mind. <laughs> so here we look inwards. <laughs> we look outward with our eyes. <laughs> and inward with our prajna, our eye of wisdom. <laughs> And we can do this at the same time. Oh, then the day, And this becomes a very good practice of Mahamudra. <clears throat> we don't need to stop looking out. But we need to take our eye of wisdom and have that look in. So if we first work with this practice with the television, then we can later extend that to everyday life and seeing real people. So if we first work with this practice with the television, then we can later extend that to everyday life and seeing But it's difficult to begin the practice with real people as the first step because 
not only do we have to um, pay attention to looking outward and looking inward at the same time, but the person's going to be saying things to us. This one the name Melara be Jerji Dadu Kartondo, Jota Nam Kandar Tondo, send in Nello the Dravadanda, Nam Kandavlo. So Milareko says that when we look directly at this nature of the mind of the present moment, then what we see will be free from concepts. It will be free from anything our concepts could label, and this will be very spacious. Simplicity. This is what we will see. Can you talk a job in Nello to Chugan Dombang or Toss? Chugan Dombang or Toss? Milareka continues by saying, Resting directly, I realize the true nature, the emptiness of all dharmas is what I realize. So when we look directly at this mind of the present moment, we then rest <clears throat> right within uh, whatever it is, whether, whether it's a conceptual mind or a non-conceptual mind of sense perception, whatever it is that we're looking at, then we rest directly within that. We don't need to search for any other place to rest. And many times we have concepts about what is the right place to rest and what is not the right place to rest. <laughs> Many times we think, oh, these emotions are not the right place to rest. You know, it's too negative. The thoughts, no, no, we cannot rest in these thoughts. It's too disturbing. Uh, perceptions, we cannot rest within these. It's too distracting. We have all different concepts, generally. but. From the Mahamudra teachings point of view, we should rest where we are, right within that. Don't waste your time for, to look for another place to rest. In that search, you never rest. Usually, we think, oh, this is not the right place, but I want to rest in the right place. We look for right place. We look for right. We never find that right place, and we never find our mind resting. So, therefore, Malarepa's instruction, Mahamudra's instruction, is rest right within present mind, right there. Chokisha. Mm-hmm. Rest directly. Yes, yeah, it says rest directly within that. We don't need to worry about is the right place, good place to rest or not. Just do it. Instead of thinking too much, just do it. You know, that's what it means, rest directly. Don't think too much about resting, how to rest, where to rest, (coughs) just rest. Um Sambate Kaingo. So you lepe ransas and ripicho tangani chas a manarepe. Milarepa then continues to describe the third point of relaxing at ease. He says letting go, relaxing at ease, I take a hold of the natural ground. That resting should be relaxed, at ease. And that resting should not be with full of stress. 
And we must remember it says rest, not stress. <laughs> so we should not stress ourselves too much, but simply rest within that. So we just let go and relax in an open and spacious way. So we need to relax at ease in the nature of the mind of the present moment. And what this means is that we don't make plans to let go and relax in the nature of the present moment mind. We just do it. We just let go and relax at ease. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <coughs> just like someone who is sitting in a chair and relaxing They don't look at where they're going to rest. You know, is it a clean surface, not? Is it soft, not soft? And they just rest. You can see them, right? <clears throat> like sometimes in India, you know, we see people working on the road construction. After working many hours, they just rest on the street. <laughs> you know, where they're working, they don't care, you know whether it's a clean surface or not a clean, resting. Like that, Mahamudra is saying, relax at ease, rest naturally, without too much planning how to rest. And if you have to think about how to rest, that means you're not resting. <laughs> if you have to think about how to relax, you're not relaxing. So therefore, <clears throat> relax at ease. So these three things are very important. Uh, essential point of Mahamudra meditation. Look nakedly, rest directly, relax at ease. These three are very important. <laughs> So just as Milarepa sings in his songs of realization, we should uh, practice these three points <coughs> as best we can. And now we'll sing all these poems on page nine. <laughs> This is also a very good song because it teaches us how to look at this mind of the present moment. All the poems are very good for this mind of the present moment. All the poems are very good for this mind of the present moment. All the poems are very good for this mind of the present moment. All the poems are all appearances of the present moment are appearance, emptiness, inseparable. All sounds of the present moment are sound, emptiness, inseparable. All feelings of the present moment are bliss, emptiness, inseparable. And all states of mind that perceive these are awareness, emptiness, inseparable. And so we rest evenly within, within these. All these forms of appearance and
so if there is time to meditate before this afternoon's teaching session, we should try to practice three, these three points during that meditation session. Um, <coughs> Carol gave an explanation this morning of shamatha practice from the perspective of the common vehicles. And we should start by doing that practice of shamatha. And once we've settled into that a bit, then we should practice looking nakedly at the moment of the present mind, resting directly within that, and then relaxing at ease. And then we can repeat that cycle of resting in shamatha for a little while, then going through these three stages. So when we, when we say look at the mind of the present moment, we're looking at the nature of the mind of the present moment. We're not examining the mind of the present moment particularly to see what it contains or to see what it's thinking about and so forth. But we're trying to look experientially at what the basic makeup of this present moment mind is. And we're trying to experience that nakedly. And so, it's helpful to remember here also that in the beginning, this naked experience will only take place for just a short instant. And um, then we'll go back to a conceptual experience after that. And that's fine. That's, that's what our um, working basis is for starting this practice, just these very short moments of naked experience. And also, in the beginning, um, it happens that the stages of resting directly and relaxing at ease also come together. So we don't really have to try to um, make them separate in our practice. So we can look nakedly and then rest directly within that in a relaxed way, or we can look nakedly and then just relax. And so this afternoon we'll look at some methods for Mahamudra meditation um, that are presented in this handout we have called the three essential points. <coughs> 